I will now turn our proceedings over to the vision panel moderator, Dara Title. Dara is a member of Abbey Wynn Housing Co-op in Ottawa and is one of the young leaders who participated in CHF Canada's Vision Summit. So Dara will be introducing our panelists and getting this exciting session started. Dara. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, can we just take a moment to acknowledge what a unique and fantastic bank Van City is? as well as to thank uh, Selena Robinson for being here. I've, in my life, listened to a lot of politicians give vague and sweeping uh, speeches around housing. And this is definitely the most specific and directed speech that I've ever heard given about affordable housing. So thank you so much for being here. So as uh, she said, my name is Dara Title, and I'm a member of the Abbey Wynn Housing Co-op, which saves my life every day. And I'm also part of, uh, I'm the Chazio delegate for my region. Thank you, Selena, for everything you do for us. <laughs> Sorry, Celine. <laughs> Got Selena and Celine confused. Um, so I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel. I'm also the only person on the stage who lives in a housing co-op, I believe, and I am certainly not an expert in the field. I don't work in housing co-ops, but uh, I don't think that's an accident. I think this panel is not going to address um, what CHF can do to meet member needs as much as it's going to address what um, co-op members, the sector, and CHF can do to meet the needs of people of society and the world at large. So on the eve of our uh, 50th anniversary as a sector and for CHF, I think that's a really interesting place to start from. And um, it's more about our vision for the future and how we can be inclusive. We are, con we are fiercely independent as a sector and that is definitely one of our strengths and we are creative and that is also one of our strengths. But this panel is about how we can be more cooperative and be better allies and to how we can all thrive together as communities as we go into the future. So I want to um, introduce our wonderful panelists. It's such a privilege to be here with everybody. Let's get started. Over here we have Shachi Curl. As executive director of the Angus Reid Institute for one of, one of North America's premier nonpartisan, not-for-profit research and public opinion polling organizations, Shachi can be found offering analysis on CBC's At Issue panel, as well as other influential forums. She is a recipient of the prestigious Jack Webster Award for Best TV Reporting, and has an alumnus of the US State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program. Welcome, Shachi. Next to her is Paul Kershaw, Dr. Paul Kershaw. Can I call you Dr. Paul? Just call me Paul. <laughs> Paul is a tenured professor at the University of British Columbia, a public speaker, and a regular media contributor and founder of Generation Squeeze, a voice for younger Canadians in politics and the market supported by cutting-edge research. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Margaret Foe. Margaret is Simshan from the Eagle Clan of the Gitga of First, Na First Nations. She, has joined, uh, she had joined the not-for-profit housing sector 24 years ago, and she is currently CEO of the Aboriginal Housing Management Association. Thank you for being here, Margaret. Okay, so let's just launch right into it. Beyond your bios, and this is a question for everybody, can we get just a one-minute snapshot about why you're here today and one of the things that inspires you and makes you passionate as an individual? Like Go right ahead, Chachi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Long walk, singing in the rain. No. Um, totally. Thank you for, for having me, and thank you all for, for being here this morning to hear us. I think uh, in terms of why I was interested and inspired to be here this morning, uh, it really is the combination of having an understanding of how people are reacting to trends around housing and access to housing, but also having watched it from a very personal perspective. I'm somebody who was born in Metro Vancouver in Richmond, BC, uh, and am of that generation that sort of saw a change in a 10 to 15 year period where being a young professional, you would go from an expectation of being able to 
access the kind of home that you grew up in or that your that your parents raised you in to realizing that it was a pipe dream and it literally happening what feels like overnight. Mm -hmm. And there are, and Paul's gonna tell you all about this, he founded a movement based on it, but um, to, to counter, I think, what a lot of policymakers talk about and what a lot of people on the market side of this debate talk about, sort of saying, well, these are, these are notions we should give up and we need to start thinking differently. Uh, yeah, okay, that's all great for all of you who managed to buy your homes 20, 30 years ago and, and literally hit the jackpot around uh, the real estate lottery. But, um, but I think there is a, a realization that is starting to dawn among policymakers that number one, this change happened very quickly. Number two, uh, public transit has not kept up with the ability to house people in such a way that we are dealing with terrible quality of life if you live outside a city core and need to get to work. And number three, uh, there is a relationship not just between housing and market prices and costs, but also that and employers and what they are offering to workers in our major urban centers. And the truth is they're not offering a lot. When you hear from the Vancouver Economic Commission or others, they brag about how cheap skilled labor is in major markets. And that's a big part of the problem. That is a massive part of the problem. So yes, housing is a part of it, but it's also transit. And it's also what are our major employers bringing to the table in order to contribute to a better quality of life, not just in British Columbia, but really in all of our urban sectors where this is to a varying degree a major issue. Thank you. Would you like to go next? Uh, Margaret, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so uh, thank you. And again, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Songhees and the Esquimalt, whose land we are on today. Um, the perspective that I bring uh, is one from the 60s scoop. Uh, I am a child of the 60s scoop. Uh, it's a policy that happened in the 1960s that saw Indigenous children taken en masse from their, their home communities, from their families, and adopted out into a non-Indigenous world. And uh, the, the strength and the perspective that that gives me, as an elder once told me, when I started working back in the Indigenous community, was that I always felt like an outsider. I didn't speak like Indigenous people. I didn't know the Indigenous traditions, the cultures, the practices. I don't sound like an Indigenous person. And so I always felt like I was an outsider. I always felt like I was judged by the people that I was trying to work with and for. And so an elder had said to me one time, Margaret, you're where you're supposed to be. And what happened in your life prepared you to be the leader we need you to be today. And I couldn't have asked for a more appropriate welcoming to come back into the Indigenous world and into the Indigenous community as a person who grew up always wondering where I fit. And so the perspective that I bring to the housing situation, whether we're talking co-ops, whether we're talking uh, uh, on reserve, whether we're talking about urban, rural, and northern communities, is the fact that we have over 70%, and I think uh, at the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association conference, they now talk about 80% of the Indigenous population are not attached to their home communities, which are traditionally called reserves. Uh, and, and so for me, for those of you that maybe have heard me speak before or have talked with me about my vision of Indigenous leadership, I don't like to use the words on reserve, off reserve, because it's not a system we asked for. We didn't set that system up. We've had to live within it. We've had to fight within that to, to define how we want to make a place in, our, in this world. And so for me, coming from the 60 Scoop uh, perspective and being able to understand what it means to be dispossessed. And if any of you have ever heard of Jeffrey York, he wrote a book in the 1980s called The Dispossessed. He did a countrywide tour of Canada where he talked to many, many First Nations. And the common theme that he came up with was a concept called the dispossessed. And that's a great, great terminology for defining what the 70 to 80% of Indigenous people 
for the most part can feel like when we're disconnected or dispossessed from our sense of culture, our sense of home community, our sense of belonging. And so for me, when I look at any housing issue, I look at it from that perspective, recognizing that we have a large percentage of our Indigenous peoples that don't have a sense of community, that don't have a sense of belonging, and how do we work in the housing sector to create that for our people, not just the Indigenous people, but the entire community that now has to live the consequences of all of these policies uh, over the last hundred years or so. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Paul, why are you here? <coughs> well, as you, my bio mentioned, my day job's as a prof, and I, I pursued that because uh, back in the day, my thinking was that we need the best evidence available about what's happening with regards to housing or earnings or childcare or transit. And if we had the best evidence, then we'd design the best policy and we would solve these problems. But partway through my academic career, it became pretty clear to me that evidence is but one factor in what shapes public policy. And if we really want to mobilize the best available evidence into public policy to solve our problems, we need to mobilize democratic muscle. We need to mobilize people to use our voices and our person power effectively through movements to uh, create incentives that allow courageous decisions to be made by our elected officials. And so I'm here today because I think the cooperative housing movement in this province and country uh, has been contributing in that way and has so much more potential to do so in the future. Thank you. So here we are in beautiful British Columbia, famous for its mountains and its whales that are in danger from pipelines and an affordable housing crisis. And we hear a lot about an affordable housing crisis in this province and also around the country. Um, but that is a very big concept and I wanna get very specific about it today. So the first question I have to all of you and like, let's keep this, uh, this moving quickly is, who is most affected by this crisis? Is it certain peoples? Is it certain regions? Let's start there. I'll start with this, um, just to flesh out some of the the, really how it shakes down in terms of community. So when you look at uh, a major urban center, if you look at the GTA, if you look at Metro Vancouver, and we are here uh, in, in BC, so let's go there. Mm -hmm. We did a study that we've been replicating over the years, uh, which we first put out uh, about three years ago, where we asked people uh, in and around Metro Vancouver uh, about their housing costs, about their commutes, about uh, their perceived quality of life. And we found people really fell into four segments. You had the happy. These were people who bought their homes prior to 1991, were re largely retired, semi-retired, not commuting, didn't carry a large cost of living, and yeah, they had every reason to be had happy. a great life. <laughs> uh, you have the comfortable, who had largely paid off their mortgages, north of 45 years of age, weren't commuting that much, and or had managed to figure out their housing costs such that they could afford to pay more to maybe live closer to the center, and their lives worked. You had the uncomfortable who were now starting to juggle two sets of pain points. Again, high housing or mortgage costs, either high rent or a high mortgage cost, combined with transit. And you're gonna hear me come back to this a lot. And then you have the miserable. These folks are really miserable. They have given up on the idea of trying to buy a home uh, or a condo or a flat or a hovel or a trailer mm. in this market. Uh, they are dealing with uh, commutes that are 45 minutes plus one way every day. Okay, so that's what they're going through. But let me tell you a little bit about these people. They are generally in their mid-30s. They're raising small kids. They're university educated. educated. They are well employed and they hate their lives to the point where 85% of them said that they would consider quitting Metro Vancouver for other parts of BC and other parts of the country if it meant that their lives were more workable. And to that I say, these are the people we can't afford to actually be evicting from our labor markets and from our communities. That is our next generation, and they are the ones who feel most affected. Interestingly, their parents, the happy, are also very concerned about these issues because they're watching with horror what their precious darlings are going through. 
Totally. Thank you. Describe yeah, me and everyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let me riff off that a little bit. Um, I like to understand what's going on today by, comparison what, by comparing what it looked like in this country when my mom was a young woman. My mom was my age. And so if I can take you on that time travel, um, you know, back about 30, 30, 40 years ago, you know, the typical Canadian had to work five years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on an average-priced home. That was sort of the average from coast to coast. It represented what you would do in this city in Victoria, in Vancouver, what you would do in BC, what you would do on average across the country. If you flash forward to today, the typical young person makes thousands of dollars less for full-time work, even though they're twice as likely to have gone to post-secondary and start off with more student debt for that privilege. And then they face home prices that have risen dramatically, such that the typical young person now, on average in Canada, has to work 13 years of full-time work to save a 20% down payment on an average price home. That's an additional eight years of work. Just think about that, like eight years of additional work to get to the same place after going to school more. And then, of course, it does vary by region. So in lovely Ontario, the average would be 16 years. In beautiful British Columbia, the average is 19 years. If you are living in the uh, greater Toronto and Hamilton area, it's now 22 years. And if you are audacious enough to think that you would get into an average priced home somewhere in Metro Vancouver, which is where half of British Columbians live, you would need to have started to save in childcare because it takes 27 years of full-time work simply to cobble together the 20% down payment. And so we've experienced a fundamental shift from coast to coast with particularly hard hit areas, most notably in Ontario and in British Columbia, but there's no province with the exception of New Brunswick where people don't have to work more to make a home for themselves. And as we have been shifting in ways where home ownership is growing further and further out of reach, we have not been scaling up other parts of our housing system, be it cooperative housing, be it rental more generally, nor have we been culturally valuing those things in such a way to actually then make people who are not homers still equally valuable citizens. And that, I think, is an important part of the conversation going forward. So I hear a lot uh, coming out of both of you regarding age as a demographic that is being hit most hard, and also urban centers throughout the country. So, um, But let's talk about different peoples who are being affected by a housing crisis. Well, absolutely. You know, I think that the housing crisis, if, if that's what we want to call it, uh, and, and I'll speak to that in a moment, um, it, it affects everyone. It affects the, the happy people, you know, the ones that have their homes because they're worried about their children or they're worried about their grandchildren or they're worried that they can't resell their house and afford to buy the next stage of their housing that they need to, to move into. So I think it does affect everyone for sure and I do believe that the youth are going to be the hardest hit, especially when you take a look at the Indigenous communities where uh, our communities are outpacing uh, new population growth by four times the average Canadian uh, population and so so when you take a look at, at youth being affected, Indigenous youth, who in the very near future are going to be 20% of our entire workplace, uh, um, Paul Martin and I just had a conversation about 10 days ago. He's a big supporter through the Martin Family Foundation of Indigenous Youth Programs. And his biggest concern is if we don't address this very reality for all of those baby boomers that are retiring and all the industries that are looking for new employees, when you know 20% of your population coming out of the Indigenous youth, we can't afford to leave the housing crisis the way it is because without housing, our youth can't address all the other needs that they need to meet in order to be that sustainable workforce into the future. Um, but, you know, certainly from a more broader Indigenous perspective, we know that the Indigenous populations across Canada have a long history of being marginalized and being overrepresented, like most colonized uh, uh, peoples are in any part of the world, uh, overrepresented on the worst of those scales. Well, I'm happy to say that that is changing uh, across the world, but here in Canada, especially Indigenous leaders are starting to take a stronger position in trying to support self-sustainability, self-growth, self-determination for Indigenous peoples. And uh, housing is central to that reconciliation for us as Indigenous leaders. But I'd also like to just bring up a point from a, a good colleague of mine actually based out here. She's a, um, uh, a member of the Sartlip Nation, Dr. Sylvia Ols Olson. She just 
just uh, graduated with her PhD and she wrote an article that talked about uh, housing is in fact not a crisis. It's not a housing crisis that we're facing here. It's a system crisis. And if you take a look at the way systems have created and evolved over the years, if you take a look at what's happening in the real estate market today that's led to the crisis in some of these urban areas, a lot of that is, and it's not about blaming the system, it's about recognizing that the system that as it was structured and as it has been implemented up to this point has failed. It's failed horribly for Indigenous peoples, it's failed horribly for the next generation. I was very excited to hear uh, Minister Robinson speak this morning and I agree with uh, with you, Dara, when you mentioned that you know, you, you've actually heard a politician get down to the brass taxes about where things are going to start to make a change and I am excited about what Minister Robinson is doing here in BC and I've worked at a provincial and national level in housing for a long time now. People are often envious of BC because we tend to be ahead of the game when it comes to housing initiatives and housing programs and again it's going to happen again. We're putting 1,750 units of Indigenous housing to ground coming up here, announcements coming up here in the next month. That's going to be fantastic for this province and I know that when I talk to other Indigenous leaders across the country they don't have provinces that are supporting co-ops as much as BC is supporting co-ops. They don't have uh, provincial leaders that are supporting the Indigenous community or the youth needs the way that the province of BC has historically and is into the future going to support those populations. So I want to start riff off of what you're saying there to get to our next question which will be for Shachi yeah. which is that I mean I've worked elections in Metro Vancouver and housing affordability was on the lips of every single person I spoke to and I spoke to thousands and thousands of people. And it was the first thing on everybody's mind, no matter where you were in terms of your class or your background. So uh, in BC, I think that you guys have successfully manufactured public demand for action, real action on uh, affordable housing. And uh, my question to you is to set the stage for us for the rest of Canada, and not just within urban centers, but do Canadians uh, agree that housing affordability is a top issue? And if so, how can we as a sector capitalize on that? So uh, BC, particularly Metro Vancouver, but you know, even Greater Victoria, uh, Greater Kelowna, um, yes, it was the number one issue. The reason Minister Lena Robinson came to speak to uh, you all this morning is because the election hinged on affordability of housing mm -hmm. and not just talking about the hardest to house in our societies but talking about everyone and people like Paul and his mobilization politically to get people aware of it and to force uh, politicians hands around this issue um, you know five years ago three years ago if the provincial minister of housing had shown up to an event like this if uh, he or she would have talked to you about all the money that's gone into, again, talking about the hardest to house, talking about affordable housing within the context of really subsidized housing and, mm. and most subsidized housing. Not around a larger policy question of how are we going to have our skilled, professional, young class working in this province. So this, this has been a bit of a unique outlier. This is... Uh, a politician who is not talking about the changes that this government is making because, sh sh with all due respect, uh, not because uh, this is some sort of mad, bold policy uh, program that they are pursuing in the face of opposition, but because two-thirds of people in this province support tax changes today that are aimed at cooling the market and increasing access to housing. That is unprecedented. It is unheard of and it represents a fundamental shift. Now how do you carry that across the country? Well, we're already starting to see some changes, um, but really, really tiny ones. So the Bank of Canada is sort of dancing at the margins of this. You hear uh, Stephen Pelos talking about two things. One, we are over leveraged as a population in terms of the debt that we're carrying. Most of that is housing debt. So we're not necessarily going to see interest rates going up. But at the same time, you see the CMHC coming out in particular markets with tougher stress tests for being able to to buy in in order to try and prevent collapses. OK, so that's the, the banking side of things. What we've moved away from, particularly at the federal level, 
was the level of investment at, uh, from Ottawa uh, in terms of understanding that for many Canadians in 1980, in 1979, in 1986, uh, was that they saw being in stable housing, owning a home or participating in the housing market as actually something that made them feel Canadian. So we saw a lot of investment in things like co-op housing at the time uh, because that was seen both politically and from a policy perspective to be a win. We've moved away from that. We've had 30 years of the market taking care of the market as opposed to nest taking care of people. Uh, what I think you have today with this federal government is at least a sense of in certain parts of the country there is an awareness and aliveness to the fact that some things need to change, but accountability is going to be a huge part of it. All eyes are watching what this provincial government does. Mm. There is support and buy-in for what they're doing, but guess what? If they're not able to move the ball, there's going to be a tremendous amount of disaffection. And in the same way, the amount of political accountability and pressure uh, that Canadians themselves will or won't apply to the federal government around these issues will be what creates the pressure for politicians to act on these issues. Absolutely. And I really feel that um, for the last federal election, we at CHF had the You Held the Key campaign, and that was about putting messaging into the hands of politicians across the country, and I think we were really largely successful. Thanks, Doug, for, <laughs> for helping with that. Um, and I think the task moving forward is actually to put affordable housing into the mouths of our friends and our neighbors and our communities at large, so that we're manufacturing, as, as Shachi's describing, this like massive public demand for housing, which isn't just perceived, in my opinion, as being something that makes us safe and happy. It is something that makes us safe and happy, as Margaret was describing in her communities. Um, so moving on to Paul, I am a young mother. I have a growing family. Uh, my partner and I both work mid-level jobs. Shachi has described my demographic perfectly. Uh, I live in a Canadian city. Uh, my partner is from Vancouver. I'm from Toronto. Neither of us feel like we could ever afford to move home, which is actually really sad in an existential sort of way. <laughs> So, uh, just like lay it on us, how screwed is my generation <laughs> compared to my parents? Um, well, it's very purposeful that I founded an organization called Generation Squeeze, not Generation Screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that, like, we had long conversations about what should, be, what should we be trying to evocatively describe uh, for a younger demographic. But if we're screwed, there's no hope. Right. And I'm absolutely certain that there is hope. Uh, so we went with squeeze because I think we need to understand the degree to which a younger demographic has been dealt a lemon. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit more information on how bad that lemon is. Um, but we can squeeze back and we can make lemonade. And so I think that that is the message I would say. We are not entirely screwed. We actually are squeezed. Uh, and we're going to have to make adaptations individually. We are going to be living generally smaller than people did back in the day. We are going to be living with less access to the ground by comparison with people back in the day. A large proportion of newcomers to our country and younger demographic are going to not be owners in the same way as back in the day. Um, and did I say we're going to have to live further from where we work or study? Did I mention that one? So those are, things, those are adaptations we are already making. We're also going to have to delay. And we see that. People are delaying moving out of their parents' places. People are delaying uh, you know, starting homes on their own. They're delaying starting their families, which is a mm -hmm. massive part of the reason why actually we see a huge change in the average age of birthing in this country. Um, so these are major adaptations that young people are making. And I don't think that is in, in and of itself entirely problematic. Because I don't think we ever guaranteed any demographic you know, that the planet was going to constantly be giving an increasingly better and better standard of living. And indeed, there's some, lots of evidence that the planet can actually sustain that. So we can look to other parts of the planet where people have been living as renters as a much more common part of their culture norm for a long time. And those are cool places too, and we can do that here. And they've been living more in, uh, in smaller places with access to balconies and figuring out how to have their, raise their kids. I say, go play on the balcony. Don't go play street hockey on the road. We can do those things. But as a younger demographic is making these many, many adaptations, we need to be willing to acknowledge that. It's time to stop describing a younger demographic as being lazy, whiny, entitled, mm. consumerist, because those actually uh, don't disproportionately describe a younger demographic. 
And then I just want to riff a little bit off Shachi's observations about like, what do we need to take from British Columbia across the country that will be important in engaging uh, public policymakers around the issues that are really squeezing a younger demographic in severe ways. And that's namely that the problem is massive. Mm -hmm. So if I think about the, uh, on the, the most recent Ontario provincial budget, um, there the, the, the Ontario provincial a year ago had its fair housing plan. And, you know, and made a range of important first steps to trying to not let Ontario see the worst of what we've seen here in British Columbia. But by the next budget, they said, tick, yeah, kind of did that, and the languages and things are stabilizing. Similarly, at the federal level, our budget actually says, oh, even in the major areas of the GTA and Metro Vancouver, that, you know, the data suggests that things are stabilizing. Well, it may be fair to say that prices aren't going up quite as much as they were before, but we need to acknowledge the chasm that has unfolded between earnings and the cost of housing now. And we have to recognize that it is a massive, massive issue. And I think that is something that started to turn here, that people are recognizing that it is just growing so great. So we need to bring that and continue to remind politicians, but here's the rub. Mm. This is the hardest part of all. High home prices aren't uniformly bad or uniformly good. It all depends on when you wanted to get into the housing market. And so for my mom's demographic, for instance, that is a group of people who have more wealth than any group of retirees ever had heading into their retired moment. Now, I want nothing less than for my mother to have a healthy, financially secure retirement. What son or daughter wouldn't want that for his mom or dad or aging loved ones? But at the same time, I need to reach out to my mom and all in her cohort and say, we need your help. We need you to think differently about what your home is and what kind of affluence and security you've achieved as a result of, actually in many respects, our hard work contributing to a housing market that's driving up your home wealth. Mm -hmm. And we need to find some way to ask them to help adapt with us. Mm -hmm. And that's a more complicated conversation because one thing that exists in most provinces around this country is one of the primary concerns of a politician is to protect people's home equity. And so I guess I often, like, do we want to protect it where it is in 2018 or where it was in 2017 or where it was in 2016? Like, these are complicated conversations because one person's gain in wealth has really hurt somebody they love. And we need that intergenerational solidarity around the Thanksgiving table to play itself out in the world of politics. And the more we can do that province by province by province in a national housing strategy, the more likely we're going to be innovative and come up with strategies that work for all generations. Thank you. And of course, not everybody has parents who are homeowners as well in this country, and we need yeah, to be thinking about right. their needs as well. So, um, Margaret, I want to ask you something. So, for several years now, the government has, of Canada has taken actual responsibility for what is a serious Indigenous housing crisis. And what follows from that is that our federal government, and by extension our provinces, our territories, and our municipalities, must be doing more to fix the problem that they've created. So uh, without oversimplifying the issues and understanding that the needs of Indigenous people are manifold and not every Indigenous person has the same needs, I'm wondering if you can provide a couple concrete recommendations to government on Indigenous housing. Sure. Before I get into that, I just want to pick up a little bit from where my colleagues were speaking. I feel really old now all of a sudden. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, but I also kind of feel like my generation is the ones that are going to end up being screwed out of this because my daughter is never going to leave my house uh, from what I'm hearing. Uh, she's 25, by the way. She's an incredibly intelligent young woman. She just came back from Japan uh, where she had a teaching stint, but she's panicking herself about uh, uh, getting the right job, the right uh, enough income. When are they ever going to be able to afford to buy a home and that she basically is just going to live with me until I go to an old age home so I'm a little bit worried about that um, and then the, the other part is you're right she's also said she's not in any rush and we see this with all of my nieces and nephews they're not in any rush to have any children either so when will I ever be a grandma you know I mean I gave my mom a grandbaby when I was 24 and my daughter is now thinking 35 maybe 40 Wow. I'm going to be it's really old by the time I get to enjoy that stuff. But, yeah. but, uh, and but it's so related to housing. It is so totally related is. to housing. Like and housing and is and now an issue of reproductive it rights. Is. <laughs> it is. It is. 
It's very, very interesting how the how the teepee turns. Um, but back to your question around Indigenous housing, you yeah, know, without... Yeah, some concrete over, recommendations. Yeah, without oversimplifying it, you know, when Paul uh, Martin and I had a conversation last week, he tried to trick me and asked me what the difference between rights to housing for on-reserve population and urban Indigenous people are. And the truth of it is there is no right to housing. And so a concrete recommendation would be to stop using the fluffy words, uh, you know, and, and as you all know in the National Housing Strategy, rolled out, they talked about using a human rights-based approach uh, to addressing housing, but they don't talk about housing as a right. And mm -hmm. so in order for us to actually make those changes, we need to be pushing governments at all levels to start looking at housing as a basic human right. And as we all know with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if we don't at least address those basic needs and safety and shelter are key to that, we can't help our generations achieve the next levels that they need to achieve for self-sustainability. And so one would be get away from the fluff and get away from the, the pandering about uh, human rights and get into the right to housing uh, entrenched in policies. The other one that we're working on from an Aboriginal housing management perspective From both our organization, AMA, and the uh, Canadian Housing and Renewal Association in Canada, we've just created through the Indigenous Working uh, Caucus Group, uh, it's a long name, uh, a strategy called the For Indigenous by Indigenous. So anything that happens with regards to the Indigenous housing needs, whether it's in the province of BC or anywhere across the country, ought to be led by Indigenous mm -hmm. peoples, for Indigenous peoples, because without that, we can't actually achieve what we need to be achieving. Absolutely. And so finally, you know, I kind of touched on this earlier, the third strategy that we need to focus on when you recognize that our Indigenous youth are outpacing the growth of any other population here in Canada, that we need to address the evolution of, of youth and, and that this chasm that, that uh, Paul talked about between sustainability. I mean, most Indigenous people gave up on the right to housing long, long time ago because of the screwed up systems that are in place here in Canada. And so if we want to recognize that that 20% population of, of, of our next generation that's going to be in our workforce, we need to start fixing that from a housing perspective. And, and from my end of it, anything that we're going to do for our next generation has to start with housing first because they're not going to be able to focus on education. They're not going to be able to focus on their families, supporting their families. They're not going to be able to focus on work if they can't even have a safe place to go home to. So mm -hmm. I would say that they need to have housing policies that address that. So Margaret has preempted a question I have for later in the program, but I'm going to be a nimble moderator and I'm going to jump around. Um, let's talk about housing as a right. So can we all agree, like just get it out of the way, that housing is a human right, should be a human right? Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. You'll have me agree, but I'll raise a strategic <laughs> question about it in Canada. Yeah. Well, Margaret said yes. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but so far, principle. Canadian human rights law does not agree with us. And uh, I was hoping that each of us can share a quick argument right now. Why should housing be considered a defined human right from which other rights, like the right to health, the right to safety, flow? And uh, let's start with Paul. Oh, can we not start with me? We... <laughs> well, well, Margaret sure. just said it. So. Margaret just said it. Um, so the home's first idea, in many regards, comes from a population health standpoint, which says that if you do not have that security of shelter uh, over one's metaphorical head, then addressing all other parts of one's health and well-being are really hard to manage. And so right. it really is foundational for health and well-being. I think that's a principal reason for why we should think about uh, housing as an entitlement in that regard. But now I'm going to pivot, and this is why I didn't want to start first. I actually think in Canada it's a risky strategy. Hmm. Because for better or for worse, in Canadian culture, if you don't talk about people's responsibilities, as even often before you start talking about their rights, you're going to have a lot of Canadians lean away. And so what I would argue right now is to say, what are, in addition to our sense that, no, it seems crazy in an affluent country like ours where people actually go without adequate shelter, we can, start to, we can also talk about other values that uh, get a lot of Canadians to lean in. Like, you know, people should have to work hard in order to get ahead. Uh, we can then say, but we hope hard work could pay off like it used to. Uh, and I think if you marry that sense of hard work with a conversation about entitlements, we're much more likely to get ahead. Because unfortunately, in our cultural context, 
regardless of what is or is not written in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, we have a large part of our society that is culturally oriented toward worrying that if we are too generous with our rights, people will opt away from their work. And that is a cultural motif we have to be very careful to manage if we're going to make public policy change by getting a large enough part of the population saying, yeah, this is a time to make transformational housing reform. So I think you're zeroing in on something, which is that we're speaking to two, like, different audiences, yeah. and we're using different things in different ways. These are different tools. So housing is a right, as a human right, is something that would be enshrined in our charter. It would become a law. And so this has the capacity to be used in terms of law, policy reform, and in order to take uh, people who are discriminating against that right to court. So I think it is quite a powerful tool, and it's something that we would bring up to our policy makers and our governments as their obligation to ensure for us. Um, which is very different than the way that we campaign to the public. So I think you are zeroing in on like the difference between messaging to different audiences and how different things can be used. But I do see all of these things as being part of a toolbox and used in collaboration with one another. I like the idea of many tools in a toolbox and using all of them because the problem is so severe. Totally. All right, Shachi. I'm going to take a slightly different view of this. First of all, just so that everyone understands in the room, my work and my role at the Angus Reid Institute actually prevents me from taking positions on issues, so I just okay. I need to be really clear about that. And so I can talk to you from, you know, a personal standpoint, I can talk to you from the standpoint of the data that we get. Um, look, there is a competing to Paul's uh, point narrative for at least 40% of the population in this country that economic upward mobility is a right, that holding on to the equity that they've built up in their home, regardless of whether or not we should be using housing as a tool to build equity, we can do a whole other panel on that. Uh, but the idea of losing that equity or seeing a softening in that equity, uh, they would argue for the right to hold on to that just as forcefully as those in this room and those, on, on, uh, and those of you on this panel would fight for the idea of uh, housing as a human right. I think we know that when governments and society invest in housing, populations do better full stop. Mm -hmm. whether it's enshrined in the Constitution or not. In the United Kingdom, after the First World War, look, folks, it's not written in the Magna Carta, but the First World War revealed how badly people in Britain were living. And it's what led to council housing 100 years ago. It's what led to uh, the first forays into government-subsidized and supported social housing. So. You know, we know that society does better when, to, to Paul's point, when there is a roof over people's heads. Mm -hmm. Now, in, so I, I think there are certain demographics and populations that have been so chronically underserved generationally that, yes, you know, there is an argument to be made from a policy perspective, from an economic perspective, particularly when we talk about the unmitigated disaster that is First Nations housing, that the priority needs to be there and the recognition of right needs to be there. But you've got to be able to um, balance that against the fact that these types of investments and commitments also take a lot of cash and we have to be prepared to have some tough conversations as a population but where that's supposed to come from. You made a comment earlier about pipelines. There, there's, there's about 40% of the country that would say, if you want to spend on housing, if you want to cool the market, which brings hundreds of million dollars in property transfer tax revenue into government, where's the money going to come from? So it's not just about the recognition and implementation of rights-based policy. It's also having that conversation with people outside of this room about how we all intend to get there together. This is great. I like it when people have different opinions and different perspectives to bring. Um, so let's talk about campaigns then. <laughs> 
let's leave policies and laws and move on to campaigns. And let's talk about equity and discrimination in the context of campaigns. So in progressive spaces that I often frequent, the language of anti-discrimination and equality is becoming more and more common. And I think that uh, we have movements like Black Lives Matter and Idle No More and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to thank for that um, uh, awareness building and that rise in public education around equity. Um, and here we are in our housing co-op sector and we have been, since our inception, founded in these principles of inclusion and justice and community. And in my opinion, we don't brag about that enough. So how can we better leverage the equity-focused roots of our movement and take our place as members of broader social movements? And what can we learn from these recent movements in terms of moving the bar forward in co-op housing? Does anybody want to jump in with that? We don't have to hear from everybody if somebody has an answer because we're running out of time. Sure, I'd kind of like to actually pick up where Shachi was just talking about this whole equity thing and, and, and it sounds like I'm going to take a step back to the right to housing concept. Great. But somewhere along the conversations and I, you know, but pardon my, my brain here, I've been undergoing a number of treatments that have caused me to forget who I've talked to or who said what, which is all in your favor actually because you can tell me anything and you'll never come back to you. <laughs> but somebody just talked to me about an approach back east that uh, they talked about the right to housing does not have to mean we all get that white picket fence and that acreage and that you know uh, self-sustaining home. Uh, we, we have to broaden our perspective of what that concept of right to housing could mean and it goes down to the basic concept of just giving a shelter for somebody uh, whether it's co-housing, whether it's co-op housing, whether it's transition, whether it's shelter. And, and so for me when we talk about, about equity I, I think that we, we can still push the feet of government to the right to housing concept, but mm -hmm. be realistic about what that actually means in an implementation phase. But I'd like to focus on the, this whole movement sector. Uh, for me, I take a look at the hashtag Me Too. And mm -hmm. if you take a look at the indigenous world, and, and, and I had the privilege of my 25-year-old daughter graduating from criminology at UFV, I went to a UFV forum on the sex trade industry, and I was appalled to hear that in the sex trade industry across Canada, Indigenous women are seen as less than disabled and transgender sex trade workers. We are seen as disposable. And that's not just seen as disposable at a sex trade official industry, it's disposable in the community. And that's why we have the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Inquiry. That's why we have the Highway of Tears, because there's a system of inequality that has oppressed the Indigenous women for far too long in this country. And I'm excited to hear that the co-op uh, industry has an equity-based focus on this. And so if we were to take a look at ways to actually have meaningful impact, it would be taking a look at the very things that are not changing and finding a way to utilize our housing sector from the co-op sector to the indigenous housing sector to the transitions, shelters, AHOPs, all those programs that are out there to find a way to put a solution to government that actually will stop these cycles because the inquiries aren't doing Doing it for us. Mm -hmm. They're just reopening wounds. Let's find solutions. We have that expertise in this room here. So my argument would be from an equity-based approach, let's take a look at what we have and create solutions from within our sector and forget about government trying to actually find those solutions for us because they haven't done a good job so far. Thank you. Okay, a sentence or less from either of you if you'd like to jump in. Yeah, two quick thoughts. Is that all right, Shoshi? Two quick thoughts. One, I would love for the cooperative housing movement to learn from the childcare movement, mm -hmm. which I think for too long got accustomed to simply being content for asking for scraps, the leftovers in budget, the rounding error in a budget, to say we can be really reasonable about what the policy solutions are, but our vision needs to be inspiring. I don't think we should be content with just 5,000 more cooperative homes in British Columbia over 10 years. I'm not sure that's a bold enough goal. I think our goal should be restoring affordability forever and then having the cooperative housing movement make its claim about the major role it could play in achieving that as we transform the system Absolutely. that Margaret was talking about. So I think a bolder vision that's not content with scraps is critical. And then, yes, yes, yes. 
And then who is under 45 in this room? Yeah, some of us, myself included, yeah. It's like a third. Yeah, okay, it looks good. Politics responds to those who organize and show up. And one of the really interesting things about a younger demographic, including those especially oriented towards injustice and inequity, is that there comes a moment when they feel a little bit uncomfortable actually advocating for themselves. But the problem is, rarely do other people advocate for you. Mm -hmm. And so we do need a younger demographic to one, uh, come together and find its voice and find its democratic muscle to actually say we need some help. We're going to adapt individually and we need our communities to meet us part way. And we need to do that in our community spaces and at certain moments, man, we need to do that in the world of formal politics because that is where tax dollars are collected. The trouble is that we're all so tired with our commutes and our jobs and our children. <laughs> and George, this takes a lot of, or no, organizing takes a lot of volunteer hours, right? Well, yes, okay, but the boomer generation will tell you all about how tired they were. Sure, yeah. everybody feels tired. Paying off mortgages at 13% and paying for gas that was really expensive and not eating avocado toast and all the rest of it. So uh, I say that tongue in cheek. Um, but what, what I would like to hope, and what I think Paul and his movement and his organization so exceptionally and beautifully tapped into was taking that fatigue and taking that desperation and taking that anxiety and channeling it. Right. And uh, we haven't had a lot, I think, in our young lives to feel particularly fatigued or anxious or desperate about it's coming to that place and we have an opportunity to really start to say, you know, they talk about it in terms of women in work, they talk about it in terms of representation. You want to call it leaning in, you want to talk about stepping up, call it whatever you want to call it, but we have a unique opportunity to be part of renewal and it is our job to take that on. It is our job to take on what Paul is doing, what we're doing by looking at these issues, what you're doing by moderating this today. Uh, but we need our friends to actually, you know, be with us. Amen. All right. Nice, nice we're out of time, but I want to leave you guys with one really quick thought, because I like this question. <laughs> um, so, you know, the co-op sector, we have been, uh, you know, going through a defensive period. We've been trying to protect what we have over the course of many decades of austerity governments who have neglected to invest in our movement and in invest in the growth of more housing co-ops. And I think when we do that, we sometimes lose sight of our ambition. And moreover, we lose sight of the people who could benefit in the world at large from more co-op housing. So I, I want to just have one sentence, and I pray one sentence each. <laughs> um, what is the boldest policy solution that you could offer? Like dream board here. This is the Vision Summit panel uh, to our sector and to this room. And then we will say goodbye. Anybody well, can jump in. I guess uh, from, 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 uh, from not just the Indigenous perspective, but uh, you know, if we just take it from that starting point, anything that happens with regards to meeting the housing needs of our communities, anything that affects the Indigenous community ought to be led by the Indigenous community. And I'm, I'm just thinking of a conversation I had with Minister Robinson about a month ago, uh, and we were just kind of going back and forth on Indigenous housing, and I jumped in and kind of gave her a little bit of criticism over not including AMA at the table when it came to the women's, uh, the recent rollout of the women's funding uh, for women fleeing domestic violence because we're overrepresented there. And she, she said to me, you know, Margaret, she said, I just get the feeling that I should just shut up let you go, go, get out of your way, and, and we'll get what we need to have done. And so whether it's the indigenous sector or the co-op housing sector or the youth housing sector, again, we are the experts in this field. So we need to be driving the direction and the outcomes. And I, and I agree with you, Paul. 5,000 sounds great, but is it really going to meet the needs of the co-op industry? And if it isn't, then don't settle for 5,000 units. If uh, 1,750 units that are coming out for, for BC's indigenous population are not enough, and I can assure you they're not, 38,000 units need to come to ground across Canada just to bring the indigenous core housing need down to the national average. That's a crisis. We need to be driving it, not the government.
I'm not good enough to do it in one sentence, but I'll do it in four quick, short sentences. There is no silver bullet. If you're looking for one policy solution, we've actually already lost. We have to use every tool in the toolbox. Those tools will include reducing some kinds of harmful demand where people say, I want to keep a home empty. Uh, we need to overcome nimbyism so we can dramatically add supply in parts of our communities that are underutilizing the land. We need to rebalance how we tax earnings and housing wealth, particularly wealth above a million dollars. And here's the point that I'll end on for this group. And we need to dramatically scale up the share of our housing system that is sheltered from commercial factors, and the cooperative housing movement could be a key driving force for uh, radically scaling up that part of the system. Thank you, Paul. Shachi, I know you can't give policy uh, opinions, but do so, you have anything to add? Well, what I, oh, I would say take a, take a chapter, take a page from the glossy brochures that the, that the four market real estate companies have. They are masters at creating demand. You leave this room, on average, how many Canadians have grown up in a co-op? How many Canadians can actually tell you what the heck a co-op is? It's a foregone conclusion for all of you. You're all subject area experts in this. The urban populations of this country are not subject area experts and they are hampered by the fact that there aren't a lot of co-ops out, out there as a model for them to say, I want that. Mm. You gotta raise awareness. You've gotta push this as a solution yourselves. Use the voice that you have to do that. And people will then say, ooh, that looks like a good idea. That looks better than what I'm currently doing. Let's go do that. Why aren't we doing more of that? Hey, politicians, what, we'll get behind that. But you actually have to start by reminding people of the value that you bring. Right. And I'm going to challenge you to do that because I would argue that most people don't know enough about the value that you bring. I love that. This is a perfect note to end on. We are a room of 700 experts. We are all champions, and I hope that we can take these messages out to the public and to our neighbors and to our friends and our communities. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much to the panelists. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Thank you, all the panelists.